algorithms are playing into it a tribal mentality is playing into it what we need actually is aspirational politics for our political leadership to universalize messages of empathy and greater fraternity these are our constitutional values which is why we set up government quite quite frankly under our constitution right <laughs> Hi, I'm Shoma Chaudhary. Thanks for watching Inquiry. Over the last week, there's been a very sharp standoff between the government and Twitter, with the government asking the social platform to take down more than a thousand accounts, primarily for using a hashtag that said, PM Modi plans a farmer genocide. At first, the platform did comply, but after a few hours, it reinstated many of the accounts, saying that the government order was not proportionate. Now, the government has promised penal action. This standoff raises many crucial and complex questions about freedom of speech, censorship, the law of the land, the role of private sector companies, and the weaponization of emotions. To declutter everything that's at stake, I'm delighted to have two excellent speakers on inquiry today, Rahil Khurshid, who was the head of Twitter India for many years, and Apar Gupta, who's a lawyer and the director of Internet Freedom Foundation. Thank you very much for joining me on Inquiry. Thank you for, thank you for having thank us. Thank you for having us, yeah. So Rahil, I wanted to start with you. You know, you helped Twitter grow in India. Uh, you also were in charge of uh, news, politics, policy, in, 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 in addition to everything else. What do you think about the position that Twitter is taking uh, on the current controversy about not taking down the accounts that the government wants it to take down? I think it's a good position. It's a nuanced position in context to a partial compliance of the order. I think it's the best they could have done in the circumstances, knowing very well that uh, a partial compliance, if the government did indeed want to push, uh, would, would end up with their staff uh, in jail. So uh, the fact that they have taken this position, the fact that uh, it's, it's a risk, uh, you know, like pushing the government uh, the way they have, uh, and standing up to it, if I may say, uh, even even partially, is uh, I think it's a uh, it's it's a fairly brave stand. So I'm going to come back to you about this question that the government is posing about, you know, how, how do you look at a corporate private company taking on the constitutional laws of a country? Uh, so I'm going to come back to you, but Apar, what what do you think about what the government is asking of Twitter? Is it right to do so? Is Twitter right to be uh, resisting it uh, on the principles of law as well as of freedom of speech? What do you think about it? So uh, I think Ryle's fairly clear with this when he says that Twitter has taken a brave step because there is imprisonment of up to seven years. This is a criminal penalty. Usually American Silicon Valleys have not done it, and especially in favor on an honor issue, which concerns freedom of speech. It's quite easy for it to suspend these accounts, go about the business of the day and maintain a good relationship with the government. Why it's not done so as per the public post and the blog that they are posting is because they believe that the actual direction which has been sent does not comply with the constitutional framework of India itself. And they cite reasonableness and proportionality. What would that mean? And we don't know a lot because the order is secret. The laws uh, which have been framed and are arguably unconstitutional, but are still in operation, allow the government secrecy on these directions which are sent to platforms like Twitter. So we don't have a complete list of the accounts the number of the accounts, or the reasons why they have been sought to be uh, suspended. We do have a press release which has been posted after Twitter's walk with the Ministry of Le Electronics and IT, but even that doesn't say a lot. Now, in this larger environment of secrecy, uh, the stand adopted by Twitter, which is a private corporation, a foreign corporation, does not have a local office in India, is brave, but is imperfect. Private corporations, even when they operate social media networks, to which my much more progressive understanding is a much more of a public square, are still imperfect uh, stakeholders in the censorship uh, dialogue. It needs to be the end user. It needs to be Caravan Magazine who should get the show cause notice, the opportunity to go before government, present their defense, and then 
if the blocking direction is issued, be served with that. So they can go to court, like the Delhi High Court possibly, and challenge it in a red jurisdiction. Twitter by itself receives a notice for blocking these accounts, risks a jail term if it doesn't take it down, and where is caravan in any of it? Nowhere. Where are the readers of the caravan in this? Nowhere. And it also then displays a level of irrationality because such secretive processes quite often lead to factual errors, which is why we also saw the head of uh, the Prasar Bharti, the principal broadcast arm of the government, uh, essentially tweeting in favor of the government all the time, their account being suspended. Secretive orders, secretive processes, risks of criminal punishment on Twitter, all of it speaks very badly for our internet governance framework. So, you know, those are really crucial points you're making. You're saying that the law itself is faulty. And so you have this very piquant situation where you have a government serving up an imperfect law to a foreign company, you know, and the company is actually trying to uphold constitutional values more than the government itself. Uh, is that an accurate summing up? So what, what you know, what about the law itself, the 69A, uh, yes. What about it is problematic, you know, for those who don't know anything about it, can you quickly spell out what is wrong? So it's a law which was inserted in 2008, right after the Bombay attacks with a, and passed through parliament as an amendment to the IT Act without any debate with about 24 other amendments. Um, it was tabled by, uh, I think so, Mr. Chidambaram at that point in time, the rules made in 2009 without any public consultation. So there was an absence of any kind of democratic check because there was no debate in parliament. There was no public consultation on the rules. And the rules by themselves were then made operational in a process which led to really weird outcomes. We have seen blocking directions uh, being issued for mostly op uh, online obscenity or copyright related concerns. But obscenity is not a ground under Section 69A. And Manoj Bitta did a fabulous front page in Times of India where he showed that the blocking directions of Savita Bhavi couldn't have been issued under Section 69A because it doesn't have the phrase morality or decency. So the government has always sought to overreach and there's been a level of secrecy in how it's caused censorship through Section 69A. Uh, the process which is there is under the rules. The law is under Section 69A. It is right now in some form of challenge. And I speak uh, from the Internet Freedom Foundation, which is also helping to assist in a case which concerns a website called Dowry Calculator. Uh, it's not as horrible as it sounds. It's a parody website in which uh, you can go and basically put in certain metrics about your uh, complexion, height, as a groom, your educational qualification, it approximates your dowry value. And it's supposed to mock the arrange, uh, arrange, uh, arranged marriage right. meat market. And Jyoti Rajesh in their tweets about it doesn't get the joke to um, America Gandhi. That time he's in the Congress. America Gandhi uh, then writes a letter to uh, Ravi Shankar Prasad. Ravi Shankar Prasad directs it down to the blocking committee and the blocking committee blocks it. There's no notice to Tanul Thakur, the creator of the website. Uh, there is no opportunity of a defense and he doesn't even have the legal order. And this is what is problematic with the law. And this is why it needs to be challenged. It's completely undemocratic. So the basic thing of natural justice is denied. You know, you, you don't know what you're being accused of. You don't have a chance to defend yourself. Exactly. Uh, and someone else is, is, it's almost like a custodian of you, which is Twitter, you know. So yeah. I'm going to come back to some more problems of the law, Rahil. There's a, again, because there's no government representative here, let me put forward their arguments. How do you see the fact that they're saying that the hashtag Narendra Modi plans a farmer genocide was false information? It was, uh, you know, in a very heightened situation, it could aggravate a situation. And it's also making a very specific allegation about someone in high office. Uh, so... What do you think from a government's perspective? Were they right in at least wanting some action on it? What do you think would have been correct uh, or proportionate action? Yeah, so I'm not going to speak for the government. I think they have more opportunity and avenues than, than any one of us have ever had in, in, in context to uh, putting forward their point of view. I think this is not the first time a hashtag, a problematic hashtag has popped up on, on Twitter, right? 
or like a problematic piece of content has popped up on the internet. Uh, what what Apar mentioned earlier, proportiona- proportionality, that's fundamentally what you want in a response uh, in a context like this. Is the hashtag problematic? Yes. Do you want uh, Twitter to take down, take down the hashtag? By all means, right? Particularly if you feel like there is, uh, there is potential or there's causality to be established in context to online speech and offline, offline uh, violence, for sure, like you are well within your rights to demand action. But if you are to then lump within this action uh, accounts and content that's generally critical of you in other areas of speech, uh, the result of which is, as Apar pointed out, uh, an order that that we don't know what it contains. We don't know the uh, we don't know uh, how much it contains. You are obviously, you know, when you have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. That's fundamentally what has happened here. And uh, to to in Twitter's defense, and it's it's not often one sees the, says these words in context to their arbitration of uh, of speech on their platform. Uh, they have consulted their lawyers after compliance and rolled back their position to a partial compliance within the purview of Indian law. They are a company, uh, in, they are locally incorporated. So they are you know, subject to Indian, Indian laws, Indian rules and regulations. Uh, but in as much as they are uh, responsible, they are uh, liable under Indian law, their position is within Indian law. Just because an order has come from the government by by no means means that it's a legal order. Right. And I think we've seen that more often than not. Like we've seen in the offline world, for example, like Munawar Farooqi's detention yes. was yeah. completely illegal. Like what happened in JNK over the course of the last like year where scores of people have been again illegally detained without reason or the suspension of, of internet yeah. Without justification, right? So just because the order is coming from the government doesn't mean that it's 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 the it's the right order. The government is not an actor in good faith here. Yeah, no, I think that's a really important point to make. It's also important to remember that actually the government is the biggest litigant in the Indian courts. So people are routinely taking the government to court, and there's no reason why in this case, on the principle of freedom of speech, uh, why there can't be a a disagreement about what constitutes freedom of speech. You know? now, another point I want to make like quickly in, in, in context to what, what Apar said earlier, it's an unfortunate thing that we are having these platforms arbitrate free speech, right? Yes. But, yes. But, our, but, but our laws are so outdated yes. and they're always catching up to technology. The framework is so outdated. If our internet governance framework was a step ahead, like take cryptocurrencies, for example, right? Like yes. globe, like, the United States, the regime is moving to an acceptance of, of that in its commercial framework. In India, we are still no. Let's ban it. Like our instinct, instant in, instinct is to ban things, and then sort of like you know, try and reach things in a way that often, more often than not, there's no stakeholder engagement. More often than not, there's no conversation, and really just this attitude that the government knows best. No, it doesn't. There are millions and millions of instances where it's been this shit tons of data where it's been established that no, it government makes mistakes and that it, there needs to be a means of redressal, a mechanism for those mistakes to be a pointed out, spoken about, and quite possibly corrected. And when all of those avenues are shut, you, you wind up in an unfortunate position where a platform has to take this call for you, where a platform has to then determine or like fight you on the constitutional limits of your own freedom of speech. Right. But you know, people are very confused uh, about freedom of speech. And so I want both of you to weigh in on this. So one, I think we're all agreed that uh, Narendra Modi plans a farmer genocide was not a hashtag, but she was factual. And so the proportionate action would have been to take down those tweets or that hashtag rather than ask for a blanket ban on 2000 accounts, you know, and I think Twitter has already said that they did take down about 500 accounts. Uh, there's some in, which my, they, in my time at Twitter, we, I've taken down hashtags, anti-color hashtags, anti-race hashtags, 
uh, hashtags that uh, you know attack that basically you know the the terms of service it's are in that it's sense, it's like true. yeah like the terms of service like you see something not uh, conforming to the terms of service there is a provision for those hashtags to be taken down without any noise right but you know like i was saying people are confused about this freedom of expression so first i'd like us to even uh, address that that you know what constitutes freedom of expression what are the limits to freedom of expression which are not subjective is not that i like the bjp or i like the congress or i'm pro farm or anti farm it's pretty evidence based what constitutes uh, the limits of freedom of expression so i'd like you both to address that but while you're thinking about it more immediately uh, people are confused and ravi shankar prasad has raised this issue that if twitter could take down a lot of users because of the siege of capital hill then why not when there was a siege of the red fort you know so they are trying to make this as a subjectivity of twitter that you're doing that in america but you don't think india deserves that what would your response to that be apar so uh, firstly with respect to the uh, assertion of a distinction in standards of enforcement uh, i think the government itself wants that distinction and quite often argues that foreign laws should not be the operational framework in india where it consistently says the that the american first amendment which gives a very high status to speech especially political speech includes a uh, uh, high degree of uh, uh, individual liberty for instance gore vidal says better to burn the flag than the constitution and they do burn the flag there but you can't do it here right um, uh, for a variety of reasons legal as well as extra legal now it's firstly the government itself which is wanting that distinction secondly twitter does follow that distinction in which and all global platforms follow that distinction regrettably i lied because our systems of laws uh, even despite the constitutional framing of the fundamental right to freedom of speech and expression still permits a high degree of interference with that right and that exercise of that right through uh, legal provisions such as criminal defamation sedition even hate speech which has not been reformed in a manner which serves the communities who are targets of hate speech or uh, Uh, does not protect women adequately without the patriarchal framing of outraging the modesty of a woman so our uh, uh, provisions of law itself are uh, extremely regressive yet platforms follow it what do platforms say they say for us to act on them what we need are actually a legal request which comes from a court order or by a communication by the and they usually follow it if they do not follow it then they risk prosecution which is what has happened in this instant case in which twitter is actually braving prosecution by saying that you are asking for such a large demand for take down it just seems disproportionate to us and proportionality is a constitutional doctrine which has been repeatedly stated to be something which is very necessary for any kind of restriction on fundamental rights it essentially means you can't enforce a curfew across the entire city after 8 pm because there is a higher incidence of petty crime after 8 pm and uh, it would be disproportionate to taking care of it rather than just installing street lights and police personnel right so again i think you know for anyone who's Uh, not been following all the nuances of this i think it's very important to keep putting that point of proportionality that if you want to uh, debar a media house or journalists or politicians then they should be habitual offenders you know or they should yes. I mean, again like you said it's so true. it's not proportionate you're not asking for a tweet to be taken down you're asking yeah. for to be debar accounts that's what talking there's about there's one thing sorry rahil before just before uh, you go on secondly i j- just want to add one uh, one uh, component to this i don't think so platforms can be left off the hook okay also because they do have a lack of transparency which they need to improve in terms of how they adopting and applying their own standards this happens in the second category when they self police content 
where they want their platforms to be spaces of civic conversation or just engagement fun rather than constant abuse, threats and violence, which is then directed towards people. Right. And we lack this consistency. There are charges of hypocrisy because let's also face it. They're also learning a lot. They're deploying technical tools as well as human content moderators. And there will be inconsistency in how they take these decisions. But what will improve user trust and also reduce these charges of political partisanship is a greater amount of accountability and transparency, which results in how do they enforce their actions. Finally, I think there is a large amount of distinction between different platforms, how they enforce their policies in India and abroad. For instance, if you take the case of Facebook, Facebook, after the Black Lives Matter protests, instituted a very public civil rights audit. But in India, uh, as per a time, as per an article written by uh, Billy uh, in Time magazine, it is doing a human rights review, but there's not even one public announcement about it. And in the United States, there have been at least four public posts by Sheryl Sandberg, including the entire report being made public. So yes, there is a distinction. There is a grain of truth in what the Indian government is saying, but its prescriptions are essentially towards gaining a greater degree of control over the platforms rather than ensuring that our safety, safeguards and rights as Indians are protected. So a lot of important things there. One that you're saying that the government wants control rather than framework. So, you know, that's really crucial. And on the other hand, you're saying that even the platforms, uh, the social media giants, uh, their entire business model in that sense. And like you said, their self-policing is very suspect and patchy and, and partisan possibly, you know. So I'm going to come back to that. I just want to stick with the immediacy of this. Rahil, this... Uh, thing that I said about freedom of expression, you know, when Trump was banned from Twitter, uh, a lot of liberals also were in a dilemma, you know, while you may be glad that he's taken off the principle of it, uh, that they felt that the floodgates were now open for governments across the world uh, to ask for people to be taken off. So will you help, uh, you know, explain or declutter the no, right precisely, to like Trump. again, the again the uh, I think again we have to go to the principle of uh, proportionality in in context of understanding Trump's deplatform. It hasn't. It didn't come overnight. It wasn't that 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 Trump was sort of like you know sitting on the morning of like sixth of January and tweeting his usual sort of tweets, and suddenly Twitter decided to take him off. He had had multiple strikes. Twitter had had to design interstitials warning people of uh, warning people of whether those the, the uh, tweets that Trump was sending, whether they were correct or not, whether they were disputed by independent fact checkers. Uh, I think, again, like in context to this being an evolving conversation, right? Like, uh, and it has it has moved quite a bit in the last few years itself, both uh, both for both legally and from a product point of view. Uh, and I want to point out here that 2014 to 2018, when uh, when I was at Twitter, my first two years, basically, uh, the the issue of gender abuse on the platform, uh, no matter how many times I flagged it, it, it fell on deaf ears because Twitter's priorities were not tackling gender abuse in uh, particularly in the global south. Uh, it was only when that conversation went mainstream in the United States after Robin Williams. Uh, Williams' unfortunate suicide and uh, Zelda William being uh, hounded off the platform is when Twitter actually started taking a fa fairly serious view of the problem and started allocating resources to it on, on a, on, from a product point of view. And over time, the conversation then started to impact uh, Twitter's share price. Uh, and that's when, you know, the cookie crumbled and Twitter started to think about this a lot more seriously. Uh, then it has the 2016 election in that context was a fairly watershed moment uh, in Facebook's evolution of how we thought about content moderation. So in that, that it is an evolving conversation. The co platforms are constantly thinking about how to stay a step ahead of uh, how features can be abused as they roll them out, how uh, conversation can be cleaned up, how conversation... It's not like the, the, the platforms aren't comfortable being the arbiters. It's a very, very thorny crown to wear, right? Uh, 
but the way internet governance regimes globally are set up sometimes they they have to step in uh, in context to trump's deep deplatforming it's now uh, you know research uh, i think at the university of chicago a few weeks later uh, after trump was deplatformed established that there was a there was a drop of uh, there was a there was a massive drop in the circulation of fake news the government of india is kind of like tripping on itself as to how it wants to approach this problem because it is not as apar said very eloquently it is not approaching it from the point of view of the protection of our rights it is approaching this problem uh, with the larger framework of controlling our speech right yes. no and see again uh, this i'm stepping into maybe try and just wrap this uh, into some clarity is that i think it's very important to point out one what you just said that habitual misuse of a platform which is evidence based you know again i'd like to repeat it's not because i think a lot of people yeah. are confused about this it's not because twitter doesn't like trump or twitter likes mr modi or twitter doesn't like xyz or that you and i don't like xyz but that evidence based and it is verifiable that what they're saying is untrue you know so when trump claims that the election is stolen and it is verified that it is untrue uh, then that becomes a genuine reason to deplatform him you know and then of course the, and like you said there was a ratcheted approach to flagging that he is uh, habitually lying or he is habitually inciting so yeah. there was that but um, at at the other also level what other what more, more importantly a very direct association in trump's context of online speech to offline violence on january january 6 yeah but that can only be post facto you know so are you going to like the point i'm going to make is that while uh, this hashtag has brought such wrath from the government you actually have habitual use of like you said uh, calls to rape women you have uh, muslim hatred you had the corona jihad the uh, hashtag you have routinely you know i mean right now yeah. uh, in fact the bjp it cell was forwarding a show where uh, someone was asking for a whole lot of journalists to be hanged you yeah, know yeah, yeah. yes and so there's been no request from the government very often people have pointed out that mr modi's own followers uh, threaten women and there's been no attempt to even get them to defollow forget about being deplatformed you know so i think that part is very important that this is very subjective so that's the thing right like so the if the distinction is to be made in that context of what the government is upholding is it upholding free speech or is it trying to suppress speech that's inimical to its image while often often upholding and giving a bigger platform to speech that is inimical to the interests of those that the government might not necessarily like agree with or uh represent even but having made that point i want you to address what apar said from you know the fact that the platforms yes they are evolving they are they are definitely in a very it's it's not a easy position for them to be but if you step one back their entire business model rahil is made on heightened emotions polarization anger hate tribalism the business model itself is that you know so do you think that the, platforms are really to blame for the entire ecosystem that has been created look i think like in context of how the course goes with the caveat that a lot of good has come out of it but yeah no of course of course philosophy at the heart of it which is problematic uh, yeah no precisely uh look this is this is the, this conversation uh it's a really large conversation and it goes right to the heart of uh disruption uh, innovation yes the platforms are have been set up in a way and silicon valley companies often often uh, set themselves up only taking into account the local environment that they are operating in so this whole mythology of world change this whole mythology of uh you know increasing access uh to information this whole mythology of uh connecting everyone this whole mythology of building tools uh that that really have no filters in context to the spread of information uh and this whole phenomenon of like building things and only in retrospect realizing that uh 
oh shit, like we actually might have built a tool that caused genocide in Burma, right? Myanmar. Uh, that is a real thing in, in, in the Valley. And I'm really glad like the 2016 election in so many ways, the US election, I think in some ways uh, was, uh, was a call to action in context to uh, reversing this paradigm. Uh, and thinking about the impact that your technology is having in more uh, unequal contexts. So, and approaching speech itself, right? Like uh, Twitter's own position, like from uh, 2000 and, uh, 2008 when it started was that we are the free speech wing of the free speech party. Uh, turns out that that's an unsustainable position, right? Like turns out in contexts like India where speech is not free and where maybe equal speech as opposed to free speech is a better framework that takes into account centuries of systemic oppression against certain groups right. uh, might be a better way to approach this. Uh, the conversation thank, like thankfully is moving in that general direction, but still hasn't completely uh, gotten to that point in that, in that you're right that uh, it's, it's, it's an economy based on people's need to, you know, dip into serotonin. It's an economy that weaponizes our attention and quite often uh, someone who says the most outrageous thing is, uh, is what people will flock towards. And it, the narratives often become competing outrages. So apart, it's very interesting, Sundar Pichai and Satya Nadella, Elon Musk, they themselves have been saying that what we have created is just too powerful. And they've in fact been asking for regulation. I mean, even Sundar Puchai said that, you know, we, we need to have frameworks. We need to have conversation around this. Satya Nadella has just said that. What do you think uh, about creating this regulation and framework around technology? Um, and it becomes really tricky when you have like the, India's laws, you know, the uh, Information Technology Act uh, is a very, very problematic one. In fact, the Supreme Court read down 66A. So how do you think about it? So firstly, it will interest viewers to know that um, in the budget session of parliament, a large number of MPs ask questions to the government, what you're doing about so many different concerns we have with respect to social media as people become much more connected. Uh, India is the largest market for Facebook. Uh, India is the largest market for YouTube. And even if the actual revenue per user is not matching the revenue per user, let's say in Europe or the, Ameri uh, or the Americas, India is a very large market. So, and it's integrating with all kinds of human functions. It's setting and uh, causing people to win elections for products to sink or swim for influencers to set most new social norms. It's a very powerful force. And the government is saying, we are looking at amending the IT Act. We are talking to different ministries. There's no independent stakeholders, experts, despite a wealth of experts in our IITs, triple IITs, or people who are in digital rights organizations who do this for a living. No approach paper is floated. So we don't have that forward level of thinking happening as much as there's been public consultation on several other aspects. And I hope it happens sooner rather than later. Secondly, I'd really commend Rahil for saying that the underlying economics of what's building these platforms and sometimes the algorithms which are then devised towards servicing the profit motives, which are quite often by gathering large amounts of personal information are at fault and alternate economic models will need to be found. Third mm -hmm. is that when large tech visionaries and founders do say we want more regulation we need to be a bit more circumspect uh, and critical because a lot of what they have said has turned out to be um, to their own self-interest um, and quite often regulation is a very intelligent way for large business to keep out uh, upstart and uh, innovator um, and how do you mean so for instance if a large company uh, essentially just look at how tendering processes are quite often devised in India, right? A certain minimum threshold is set with respect to a, qualif a qualification criteria. So no other competitor can bid for that contract. Now yeah. just take the case of a large social media company, which is required to comply with certain kind of requirements 
uh, which apply to any kind of social media company. Uh, it would quite often disqualify other smaller uh, upstarts would nowhere have the resources of let's say a Facebook or a Google. And today there was a PIL filed in the Supreme Court for pre-screening content even prior to it being posted on social media. How many companies do you actually think can practically implement such a technical system or can license it from another third party? Not an upstart, not a new innovator, no, not the old narrative of somebody working out of their parents' garage. The latest app that's going up against Twitter who yes. has this in its terms of service that they will pre-screen content. I have no idea how they will do it. Like if at all content really takes off on the platform, it is impossible to pre-screen it. Yeah. And in any case, how, how can you have a social media then, yeah. then you're becoming traditional media, you know, where you have editors that will decide whether yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You publish I something see. or you can't. So then that's not the platforms that we are talking about. But Upar, just to push you a little bit on that, where, you know, you're someone who's working in this field, you know, you, you, you are the director of the Foundation for Internet Freedom, then if we have governments that we can't really trust for, to regulate this because their impulse is control or censorship rather than a framework, and if you have companies that you can't trust their intent because it's driven by a desire for profit and for keeping out competition, where is this mess going to go? You know, I mean, I, I, I think users, uh, when they get accustomed to certain systems, they become more sophisticated over a period of time. So the smartphone user of today, after they have changed possibly four smartphones and been on multiple social media networks, are much more educated about the individual privacy as well as the content. They have an instinctive knack of saying, no, this is seeming a bit dodgy. This may be disinformation. And we are noticing this happening with people. They're becoming much more educated. So my ultimate hope is with the people and the users because we have so many social media users in India. The second is that we need to remember no situation is perfect. Democracy is messy and companies work as per the incentives and government work, uh, work, work as per the incentive. Even if we are uh, working through a very difficult time of friction, ultimately there will be some bottoming out and a greater sense and rationality will emerge in this contest. And uh, the best we can hope for is an airshop swable in which two monkeys are fighting over and possibly the public is the fat cat which gets the piece of the bread. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I that is a lovely ideal situation. <laughs> but there's, I want to throw one more sort of mirchi into the oil right now, which is that this public also loves the hatred, the anger, the noise. Yes, it does. I mean, this entire platform is functioning on the basis that you have uncorked the people's right to be as ugly as they want, you know. Yes. So yes. I don't think that there's a great. Uh, calming effect coming from the public apart. So usually no, no, I certainly, believe in the certainly. people. And the not. algorithms are playing into it. A tribal mentality is playing into it. What we need actually is beyond the platforms, we need aspirational politics for our political leadership to universal, universalize messages of empathy and greater fraternity. These are our constitutional values. It is there in the preamble. And I think nothing will change, which is why we set up government quite, quite frankly under our constitution, right? The corporation, a foreign entity, social media, technology, all instruments towards actualizing that. And the government for whom we are voting as people essentially needs to do its job better. We've reached a state in which uh, a platform uh, is reluctantly saying that, hey, guys, uh, you've asked us to take down 1500 accounts. I, we don't really think we can do this because it's just seeming to conflict very clearly with the larger constitutional framework in which we have stepped in to operate in India. Uh, individuals can also send requests to Twitter for That's enforcing true. its own policies, but Twitter here uh, may respond to those requests based on its own self-assessment and sometimes does not give complete information on why which discloses the reasoning, but only gives a statement as to what 
uh, that it yes, your complaint did violate the community guidelines or does not. So people are left wanting, but we should also uh, recognize that the scale of the user reports, which are quite often sent to a private platform like Twitter are so immense, which is why the Supreme Court stated that Twitter, if somebody, if somebody reports to Twitter that take down this content, it's illegal. Twitter is not under legal obligation to um, uh, take it down unless it gets a court order. It's has a discretion. Yeah, the sheer volume of what they're dealing with also is uh, is a difficult proposition. You know? But Rahil, I want to address one more thing, which is this allegation of political partisanship. You know, uh, Facebook had to encounter that when, uh, you know, the, there was this whole controversy around Anki Das, the proximity to the BJP, the fact that they helped uh, the BJP rise uh, or gather a kind of following. And the same has been said about Twitter. Correct me if I'm wrong, that when Twitter first began, uh, in, in your role as, you know, being the interface on news, politics, government, would you have actively helped political parties gain a following? Did you do that? Would you have helped BJP grow? Or yeah, I, think, I think it's an important, I was actually like the five, four and a half, five years that I did this job, I was actually pretty stunned by, uh, and and which is not, uh, which is not surprising, right? Like I was pretty stunned by, uh, the powers that that were attributed to me. I think it's important to know what what roles that that particular functionaries at these platforms play. Right, you basically have no algorithmic, uh, you have no control over over algorithms or what happens on the product side. Uh, in terms of just purely how uh, my job functioned, uh, it was working with governments, working with political parties, working with news organizations helping them understand how to use Twitter better. But that was across ideological lines. No advice on content. This I alluded to earlier also, right? Like, and I've had like a revised point of view on it uh, the last three years that I've not been uh, post my last job at Snapchat. And I respect Snapchat for a whole host of reasons. Uh, One of them being that that platform doesn't prioritize uh, the economy of rage-fueled politics or cultural life. It is a person-to-person communication platform, it does prioritize the camera. And and there is something to be said about uh, a whole host of young people being comfortable with, with that form of communication. But but purely in terms of uh, the roles that, and I would like to make the distinction between uh, the Facebook controversy that, that happened last year, where it was, uh, where it, evidence was found that it had not applied its own standards on hate speech and other policy standards uh, to the ruling party in that that it had kept those pages alive and it had kept those posts alive did it uh, help furthering their reach absolutely in that that i helped political parties or the, or the job that i did help polit- political parties expand their user user base from a content point of view in i like i don't i don't think i bjp would would want to take my advice as to uh, you know uh, what to put on its social platforms so, Upper, what do you think about, you know, just in this context, the government has also been pointing out that Jack Dorsey uh, liked tweets which had the farmer protest hashtag, you know. So when you have such powerful platforms, what, what do you think about that particular allegation that he's individually showing a predilection uh, towards something? I'm quite glad because otherwise he would be an amoral profit-making machine, right? Rather than individual. So uh, I'm quite glad he has political preferences and he voices it on his platform. And that opens him up to a level of scrutiny, actually. And I'm very uncomfortable with all tech founders, as much as I do think a lot of them are visionary uh, and supremely talented and disciplined human beings. Secondly, the charges which are being made quite often of Twitter being a left-leaning platform have been debunked, at least in the United States, on the basis of long-term study, which has been done by academics across the uh, political spectrum and even on Facebook. Uh, Because uh, with respect to both these platforms, it's been found that massive disinformation networks have actually been activated by people associated with racist as well as alt-right movements, uh, principally through Breitbart, as well as several 
other information syndicates. It's been uh, through the best academies and peer-reviewed uh, papers. Uh, are very clear on this. Uh, so, you know, we don't have similar studies matching in India. And if the government does want to substantiate its assertions on the basis of facts and evidence, we have so many skilled researchers who are there in our IITs and triple IITs. Let's make the environment for them where they can go out get this data and social media companies don't want to give this data. So let's first make an environment that social media companies are actually obligated in a research context to help improve their platforms and enable Indian researchers without putting them in a system of a political expectation or a goal, which is quite often there when funding is provided to them. Give them the autonomy, let us study the problem and find out if there's a political bias. My gut sense is quite often that there is a political bias in individual decision making. Platforms by and large act as per only one bias, which is growing user reach, revenue and serving shareholder value. So I just want to end with, uh, you know, two things. Can you define apart? Like I was saying right at the beginning, people are very confused about freedom of speech. What is acceptable and what are acceptable limits on freedom of speech? And what is problematic with Indian law itself, which is why governments routinely and that, you know, it's not just the ruling government today, but across the board, across states, all governments have a terrible reputation on freedom of speech and censorship. Freedom of speech is constitutionally provided to all of us under Article 19. It's a recognition of natural rights, which means the constitution does not create this right. We all have it inherently because we are humans. A lot of censorship occurs due to self-censorship and in digital platforms, for instance, it can also occur through uh, measures beyond legal orders through essentially flooding your timeline on Twitter, right? That's such a convenient way of just crowding out all kinds of views, your inability to organize and possibly distracting you, right? That's also a form of censorship. Freedom of speech and expression is a contested area and avenue right now. And um, there are certain guidelines and principles around it, but let's always remember it is context dependent, okay? as much as it needs to be politically neutral. And a lot of things which we are today calling freedom of speech are not freedom of speech. Abusing somebody or making threats to them is actually a crime. It's not freedom of speech and expression. And I'm just saying these really obvious things, which may be obvious for a lot of um, the audience, but I see it happening on Twitter every day. You know, I just, again, when we're talking about the complexity, actually the constitution itself is a bit faulty. Because, you know, the phrase hurt, hurt sentiment, hurt religious sentiment yes. has now become so loose yes. and law and order, you know. So instead of enforcing law and order, which the government can do, say whether it's a cinema, it's a film being released yes. and a vigilante group turns up wanting to smash windows rather than controlling the vigilant group, they'll say that take the film off because there's going to be a law and order situation, you know. So I think that, and even hurt You're sentiment right. like Tandav. Uh, You're right. You're right. But here's the thing. The, the constitution is not scripture, which can never be changed. In fact, it should be critiqued, even as to its original text. But the situation we are facing right now is going beyond a rule of law framework. Where, And again, I want to double down on this. It's not because of the laws also being horrible or subjective, or the constitution being like that. It's just a pure abuse of the law. For instance, the FIRs against so many journalists and MPs in Uttar Pradesh, um, uh, arresting a stand-up comic with two FIRs in two different states for jokes that comic did not make, along with five other people. Or um, similarly, what's happening in this country, the degree of, of prosecution which is taking place is quite happen often happening beyond the legal framework, beyond our horrible laws and the horrid procedures which are there. And similarly with Tandab, the ministry did not have any legal power to receive complaints, act as an arbiter, and then determine what is legal, what is not illegal, which again reinforces the point that we are stepping into very dangerous territory 
for a for a for a country at least whose constitution makes a system of laws that we are going beyond the rule of law to what is today a rule of men usually who happen to be very powerful yeah and on the other side uh, rahil i'm going to come to you for last words but just on the other side uh, apar there's also people think that there's a right to say anything because it's opinion so for instance in the riya chakravarti case we saw a person being defamed all the time uh, you know uh, people are routinely on public platforms now you just say what you want and i think it's very important to drive home that freedom of speech also has to be evidence based if you're just lying about something which is an empirical you verifiable lie uh that's not freedom of speech no it's not and, and that's a uh, natural restriction no not at all and i think what happened with riya was more than defamation she was dehumanized over a period of weeks and this kind of dehumanization today is intersecting in digital environments with the physical safety of women quite often for instance what is happening with the journalist neha dikshit uh they are both integrating because people not only take elements of your personality shred it and distort it and then display it in forms which can drive hate towards that individual but also then decipher the habits and the points of information which may be a person's place of employment their age their, uh, their, their personal connections and drive hate towards that as well thereby bringing a level of mental injury physical duress and possibly even eventual attack so rahil i'm going to just uh, end with you you know you worked deep within these systems and across other platforms as well just as baby steps what do you think are a few quick solutions that need to be brought into place shuma look the you know earlier you guys were saying that just the volume of these complaints means that it would be impossible for twitter to to judge them manually right like i've used the product for 10 odd years i worked at the company for 5 odd years uh really like the product still i do think that that doesn't let them off the hook or that for that matter doesn't let uh facebook or youtube to other big big platforms off the hook right like just because you built a product the result of which uh was that you were getting a whole host of sort of downstream complaints and you don't have systems to deal with that well, it's your problem it's in the process like you got to you got to fundamentally build this into the systems itself uh and there are examples of products who sort of take into account content moderation from the very beginning at, at the ground floor itself the problems that we're facing is that the the current set of products that 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 we're that we're talking about are bringing in uh, content moderation post facto are being bringing in moderation after having built products that have given everyone unfettered access in sometimes a really tricky uh, political and policy environments like in a context like india where simultaneously you know there is the rise of state aided uh, vigilantism and the, the the state itself is diluting its hold on the rule of law when that benefits it and its core constituency this expectation that the platform is going to step up into a leadership vacuum uh is a completely unfounded and b is it's 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 going to like lead us to uh to depression because the platforms are going to do the right thing for a while and assuming tomorrow the government steps up and i am assume like you know my assessment of the situation current situation is uh that it was a it was a battle of the wits and twitter seems to have prevailed but if you move beyond the limits of constitution you are then like and you let other people arbitrate what the constitution defines and what what it doesn't define as opposed to the constitution itself and by other people i mean paralegal uh, actors you wi- often wind up in a situation where you then have capitalist entities an expectation that capitalist entities will do the right thing either so that's either the mainstream media or social media and more often than not it's a disappointing position to take in terms of what twitter can do quite simply ramp up its uh, staffing to enable sort of like more curated moderation and facebook as well like i don't really care if they have to employ a thousand people to do this do it i'm not the one who asked you to set up systems that result in millions and millions of tweets being sent out every minute i do feel that there is a need for a more evolved conversation uh and i'm really glad like apart is uh, 
doing some fantastic work in that context uh, via his foundation to, to fundamentally give all of us a revised framing of the roles and responsibilities of social media companies are uh, if they are free speech actors or if they are speech actors even or if they are just really you know, really well-built products, uh, advertising pro- technology products. One of my sort of like takeaways from having worked at social media companies is that, uh, and I'll say this for Facebook, uh, more than for Twitter, that it's not a social network. It's an ad tech company. Like Google, for example, has completely abdicated its responsibility in how it has com- like destroyed local journalism in the United States. As I, as I was saying earlier, it immediately gets into this conversation between innovation and the free market. But I think that conversation needs to be, it needs to be had and it needs to be had in a, in a more, more urgent uh, manner. There's going to be part one, part two, part three, part four, you know, part infinity uh, episodes to this conversation because I think it's the start of a very complex, very needed con- conversation. I think what we're looking at is like when nations are born, And they have to write a constitution for themselves. You know, technology has become such a part of our lives that it's not about control or regulation. I think we need to write constitutions for technology, you know, because it's literally governing society now. Uh, So that's where we are at. And at default, default, I'll call it a manifesto. Need to give something to the people who write YouTube comments. so. (laughs) (laughs) So... Thank you very much. Uh, 